First, you have some time to read questions 1 to 3. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 3. Hi, sit down please. How can I help you? Thank you. I'm a student in the sociology faculty. I'm coming to ask for some information about renting a room in the college or near the campus. My name is Sarah. Yes, Sarah. How long have you been here in Sydney? You are not new, I suppose. No, I'm in my second year. I came to Sydney 18 months ago from Korea. Where are you living now? I live with my aunt in my cousin's room. It's pretty nice to live with my relatives, but unfortunately my cousin has finished his term and is returning from Britain next week. I have to rent a room for myself. Yes, it sounds a little unfortunate, but I suppose it's a good chance for you to have a deeper understanding to real world. I hope so. Well, what sort of thing are you looking for? Uh, what we provide ranges from shared flat to homestay. And of course, we have houses with gardens, if you like. No, the house with a garden is obviously out of my price range. Shared flat is not bad, but I prefer a homestay. I enjoy the feeling of living with the family. When do you plan to begin the rent? Next week, you just said? No, my cousin is arriving by next week, so I hope to move out by this weekend. This weekend, okay. The main area we deal with is around the university. Around the university, aha. Uh -huh. Do you have anything near the northern gate of the university? You know, the sociology faculty is near the northern gate. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 4 to 10. Yes, uh, what sort of price are you thinking of? Well, could you give me some idea? You know, I have no experience of renting a room. I don't know what price is reasonable, but I hope it's not over $300. I see. Usually the homestay ranges from $180 per month. Only $180? Yes, to $350, depending on a number of different factors. What does it depend on? Well, obviously, the quality of the house, the facilities, and extra services. Oh, I don't care about the quality very much, as long as it's clean. As to the facilities, I want the room with the separate bathroom. Kitchen isn't a necessity, because I don't want to cook by myself. I hope to have meals with the family, if possible. OK, let me check the files. Mm, yes, I think this one might suit you. It's a family house with two vacant bedrooms. How about the owner of the house? I mean, is it a family, or...? According to the file, it is a retired lady. She wants to find college students as tenants. That's great! What's the condition of the rooms? The bigger bedroom is furnished and with a bathroom, and the rent is $320 per month. The smaller one charges $250. It is furnished too, but without bathroom. Oh, $320. It's a bit out of my range, but I think I prefer the bigger one. How about the meals? Well, the rent includes breakfasts and suppers. No lunches, however. You have to buy your lunch. That's no problem. I usually have my lunch in the college cafeteria. And that doesn't cover the water bill and electricity fee, but the laundry is included. Fine. Could you tell me the address? Yes, it's on 323 West Park Road. Let me get that down. 323. OK, it's near the university. So, when can I have a look at the room? You know, I'm a little pressed for time. The file says the landlady is in every afternoon. So, this week, say, Friday? Oh, I'm afraid I can't make it then. 
I have a lecture on Friday afternoon till 5.30. How about Thursday? Okay, that's fine. Would five be okay? Yes, fine. Just come here. Yes, here in the student service office. Oh, before I forget, before moving, you have to pay one month's rent in advance. Really? Oh, I didn't know that before. Could I ask why? As the deposit. You know, in case you damage the property or move out without giving notice. Usually this doesn't happen, but standing in the owner's shoes... Yes, I understand it all. So that's $320. OK, I'll take the money if I'm satisfied. Well, a word of advice. Don't forget to get a receipt when you pay the deposit or rent. Yes, thank you so much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a trainer giving a talk to people who want to learn outdoor survival skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our outdoor survival program. As you know, this week you'll be learning some of the basic information and skills you need to look after yourself independently in the outdoors. These first two days will be based here in the classroom and then we'll be taking a camping trip to put into practice some of the things you've learned. I'm going to start off with the topic of food. And to start with, I'll describe just two methods which we'll be putting into practice at our camp and which make use of natural resources, the steam pit and the bamboo pot. I've got two posters here to make things clearer and I'll start with the steam pit here. To make this, you'll need some dry sticks, some grass, some loose earth, and some stones. And for this week only, some matches. <laughs> the first thing you do is to dig a shallow pit in the place you've chosen to do your cooking. Let's say about 25 centimeters deep and 30 centimeters wide. Your sticks have to be a bit wider than the pit because you have to put a line of them along the top from one end of the pit to the other. Before setting light to these, you take some large stones and arrange them on top. Then you start the fire and wait till the wooden platform burns through and the stones fall into the pit. At this point, brush away any pieces of hot ash from the stones. You can use a handful of grass and then take another stick and push it down into the center of the pit, between the stones. After that, you cover the whole pit with a thick layer of grass. And then you can put your food on it, wrapped in more pieces of grass, like parcels. Finally, cover the whole thing with earth. You have to pat it firmly to seal the pit. Then all you have to do is take the stick out and pour a bit of water into the opening that it leaves. It should take about four hours for your food to cook as it cooks slowly in the steam that's created inside the pit. 
Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, simple but effective. The other method you're going to practice this week is the bamboo oven. Now the steam pit is ideal in certain conditions because the heat is below ground level. For example, if there's a strong wind and you're afraid a fire might spread. But when it's safe to have an open fire, you can use the bamboo oven method. You get a length of bamboo, which as you probably know is hollow, and consists of a number of individual sections with a wall in between. You use a sharp stick to make a hole in each of the dividing walls apart from the end one. Then you lean the bamboo over a fire, with the top propped up by a forked stick, and the bottom sitting on the ground. You pour enough water in the top to fill the bottom section and then light a fire underneath that section to heat the water. Then you put your food inside the top section and the steam coming up the bamboo through the holes you made cooks it. I'm going to move on now to food itself and talk about some of the wild plants you might cook. I'm going to begin with fungi. That's mushrooms and toads. I'm sure you'll be aware that some of these are edible and they're delicious, but some of them are highly poisonous. Now, whether they're poisonous or not, all fungi that you find in the wild should be cooked before eating because that helps to destroy any compounds in them that might be mildly toxic. But be aware that any amount of cooking won't make poisonous varieties any safer to eat. Unless you can definitely identify a fungus, you should never eat it. It's not worth the risk. And you need to be really sure, because some fungi that are poisonous are very similar in appearance to certain edible varieties. They can easily be mistaken for each other. So, having said all that, fungi are delicious when they're freshly picked, and although they are only moderately nutritious, they do contain minerals which the body needs. I'll move on now to leafy plants, which are generally... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two business studies students discussing a presentation they'll do on an article on working effectively in groups. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. So, Brad, what did you think of the article on group work? Oh, hi, Helen. Uh, yeah, it was pretty good, with helpful pieces of advice on how to make group work effective. I think we were lucky to be given such a straightforward text to present at the Management Skills Seminar. Yeah. Actually, 
Shall we discuss it now? Have you got time? Sure. It's only a 10 minute presentation. So we just need to explain and then give our views on the main points raised in the article. I'll jot down some notes. Right. So, there are three main sections. I suggest we start with listening. Yeah, effective listening in groups, because it's not something that's frequently covered on courses in our field. No, and we should say that in the presentation. Yeah, and also effective listening's pretty simple, you know. I don't think it's hard to learn. Well, people think it's easy, but in my experience, most of us tend to be very lazy listeners. Okay, I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> Something I do think we should emphasize is the power of the listener's posture, gestures, etc., in making speakers feel respected. Not that you're just waiting for them to finish, before jumping in with your own ideas. Uh-huh. Okay, right. Uh, the next section is on goal setting. Let's make sure we're clear what the article says on this. Yeah. Well, firstly, it says that all group members must be given time to explain their own goals. That's it, yeah. And then, did it say that the whole group should agree on common goals? That's a bit too strong. It's more that everyone's agendas should be equally acceptable. But it does say that goals have to be realistic, you know... Achievable within a particular time? You've got it. That's really what the article's saying. There isn't really any point in having ideals if group members know they won't come to anything within a reasonable period. So, I think a summary covering those points will be enough for that part of the presentation, don't you? Yep. Yeah. Now, the last section is about conflict resolution. Actually, I, I thought it was the worst part of the article. Me too. I don't think it went into sufficient detail on the issue. Actually, I thought it devoted too much space to it, but that it was all rather boring, you know? It didn't mention some of the more radical theories. Absolutely. I found that really irritating. Right. And also, I think it could have said more about conflict sometimes being healthy in groups. Absolutely. It just mentioned rather glibly about how we should avoid thinking of winners and losers, and that quick resolution of conflict is always desirable. Without explaining what these terms mean? Well, it gives quite detailed definitions, but doesn't develop a proper argument. Right. So, for the presentation, I think we just give some definitions and... And then explain what we felt were the weaknesses in the article's treatment of conflict resolution. Yeah, good. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, let's think about what we have to prepare for the actual presentation. Well, I suppose we'll use PowerPoint, but I'm hopeless at using it, especially if it has any visuals. I really have to look into doing a course on it because I know I'll need it in the future. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm quite happy using PowerPoint and I'll put it together when everything else is ready. That's a relief. But yes, do that later. OK. Now, I heard the tutor saying we have to include some well-chosen quotations from the article. I'm not sure if we do. I'll email him to find out. No need. I can just have a look at the specs he gave us when he set the task. That'll be quicker. But the tutor definitely said we have to prepare a handout to go with the talk. I'm not really sure how we do that. Sarah did one last year. Who's she? She's doing the same option as me on marketing. I'll ask her advice on what to include. Great. So that just leaves the bibliography at the end. I suppose it'll mainly be articles. Yeah. So we'll just look on the web, and we can leave that till later. But we've been advised against that. Well, we could have a look through some journals in the library. I think we should start by looking through module handbooks. I think that'll give us some good leads. Yeah, you're probably right. So that's all the topics. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up with Frost. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up with Frost. As you all know, for the last week we've been running a survey, trying to find out what you, the listeners, think is the greatest invention of the last two hundred years. The response has been amazing, double the amount we had last year. So thanks to all of you for taking part. We've had about two thousand responses online, and about the same on our phone lines. The lines are now closed, and this morning I can announce what the results were. So here it is: you, the listeners, have chosen as the greatest technological invention of the past two hundred years. And let me not forget to mention that sixty-five percent of you voted for this. It's the bicycle. Yes, the bicycle, first invented in eighteen eighteen, and would you believe it, the first bicycle was made of wood. The second bicycle had iron wheels. I cannot imagine what that must have been like to ride. It would have kept you fit at any rate. But for me, the best thing about the bicycle was what it did for women's rights. Yes, in the eighteen nineties, it was the bicycle that meant women could change their clothing, start wearing trousers or pantaloons, as they were known. Before then, women's clothes had been really uncomfortable, and I'd imagine quite difficult to breathe in. So, thanks to the ordinary bicycle, it was not only the man who wore the trousers in a home. Instead, women could now feel far more equal to their male contemporaries, and I'm sure you'll agree. The bicycle is a great way to get regular exercise, and of course, it's much better for the environment. And today, over one billion people all over the world ride bicycles, and for some, it's their only means of getting around from A to B. So, to all you bicycle riders out there, keep up the good work. Coming in a close second, with forty-two percent, is the computer. I found out something interesting about the computer, which is that really, this word first meant someone who did mathematical calculations. Of course, today, with the development of the personal computer, computers are being used for everything from home use to business and even digital photography. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine life without a computer now. I guess closely related to the computer is the internet. And this got twelve percent of your votes. Maybe, like myself, many of you might think of the internet as being the World Wide Web, but actually, the web is only one part of the internet. The internet began as part of the United States military network, but it later began to be used by businesses and academic institutions. Of course, today the internet has so many uses. We use it for shopping online and entertainment, as well as to find information and send emails. But sadly, there is a darker side to the internet, and some of you have sent me emails about this. Finally, with five percent of your votes, is the radio. We think the radio was invented by Marconi in 1896, and he opened his first radio or wireless factory in the United Kingdom in 1898. In 1906, a man called Reginald Fessenden gave the first radio broadcast from Massachusetts. Ships could hear him at sea, and apparently he played the violin. As yet, listeners. I've spared you from having to listen to my guitar playing, but certainly radio is still important. 
Let's not forget that it was by radio that the Titanic sent signals to other ships. And with the popularity of TV today, I was secretly pleased so many of you had still placed importance on the radio. So there you have it, the results of our survey. I think there are still important inventions that were not chosen but deserve a mention: nuclear power and, of course, communication satellite. Something which I am certain will continue to change the face of how we communicate with each other over both long and short distances. In fact, for me, the mobile phone is one of the greatest inventions of the last two hundred years. If I think back to my first phone, and then I look at what is happening now, children born today will probably be more likely to have their first experience of the internet on a mobile phone screen rather than a computer monitor. Some of the new mobiles that are now being sold make it just as easy and as quick to find information on the web as on a computer. And let's not forget that mobiles now have digital cameras, word processing facilities, so you can type all your documents, and even personal organizers. I think it's quite possible that the mobile may even replace computers one day.